Nice. I think. <laughs> All right, well, uh, several weeks ago, uh, we embarked on a series about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And uh, when I started that, uh, that was uh, my intent was to do the seven churches, and that was going to be the end of it. But a few of you uh, asked this, if I would go ahead and go on through the book of Revelation. So that's what we're going to do. We've had a few weeks off because of the holidays and that. We, we had some sermons on other subjects other than the seven churches. So this morning I'm going to sort of wrap up the seven churches segment and then we will move on the, right through the book of Revelation. So we'll know everything there is to know about it by the time we're done, I'm sure. <laughs> Good luck with that one, huh? Well, maybe you will remember uh, we, we made a few observations when we started about the book of Revelation. Uh, for some reason, people just kind of go nuts so, over it sometimes. You ever notice that? And they get all kinds of ideas and things that are uh, just not there or not meant to be there. So one of the things I want to remind you of is what the book is about. The main theme of the book isn't about end times, believe it or not. The main theme of the book is about a person. And who is that person? Jesus Christ. Yeah, Revelation 1.1 1, 1 tells us all what we need to know. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that... Now, what's that next word? Soon must take place. Not thousands of years later, not somewhere far off, but the things that soon must take place. Same thing, same language Jesus uses in Matthew 24, the, the portion we refer to as the Olivet Discourse. He says these things are going to happen soon. And so they did, and they are still happening. And you remember we remarked that, uh, of course, the Greek word for revelation is, is uh, apocalypse. And we have sort of lost the true meaning of that word because when, usually when we hear that there's an apocalypse coming, we want to duck because we think something bad's coming. But to a Greek living in the first century, the word simply meant to reveal something. So when we talk about the apocalypse of Jesus Christ or the revelation of Jesus Christ, we're talking about him re revealing himself to us. So we're going to come to know him better as we work our way through this book. And one of the main themes in the rest of the book is worship. So we'll be talking about worship a little bit. Oftentimes when we think of the book of Revelation, that's not the first thing that comes to our mind, is it? But it should be, because it's just heavily laden with the subject of worship. So in the first three chapters that we worked through, Jesus is revealing himself specifically to these seven churches. And uh, we talked a little bit about the order that they're in and why they were in that order and all that sort of thing. We mentioned that each letter it was meant for every church. They all read all of the letters. It wasn't that one church got one and, and none of the others. We noticed that these messages are very relevant to us today, just as much so as they were to the seven churches in the first century. Because the seven churches in the first century were made up of exactly the same folks that are here today. Now you may say, well wait a minute, I'm old but I'm not that old. <laughs> no, but you are a fallen human being. And so we're all subject to the human condition post-fall which means we're all sinners, which means we struggle with the same issues, the same things that those in the first century struggled with, that those in the 15th century struggled with, and those that will struggle with things in the 29th century if the Lord has not returned by then. Now, we don't know. So we're going to see that they had the same problems we have. And as we looked at those churches, you remember we saw all different kinds of churches. We saw busy churches, right? There was, they're just busy doing stuff and they're going and doing. Well, Ephesus, maybe. Yeah. And then there were, there were wealthy churches. Uh, there were influential churches. There were churches that were heavily involved with a, the with a governmental situation and they had a lot of influence in their community. And, and we saw churches that were inclusive. 
they welcomed everybody they loved everybody and it didn't matter really what you believed you were welcome because God is love and we love everybody remember some of those sure okay and we saw churches that were half-hearted they simply went through the motions of whatever they did well we don't have to look too far we can see all those churches today can't we if you go look around now what's interesting to me is and, and this is this is so godlike to those churches that you would think he wouldn't be too pleased with he reveals himself to them he comes to them he takes the initiative isn't that so godlike who took the initiative in your salvation wasn't you it was God we were lost you know scriptures plain we're dead spiritually there's nothing we can do we don't have a little tiny bit of light we don't have prevenient grace we don't have any of that stuff we're dead and then God reveals himself to us you go clear back to Genesis chapter 3 what happened the fall you remember and what, what was God's response to the fall what was the first thing he did he came to the garden seeking Adam and Eve didn't he he came to them he revealed himself to them, even though they were trying to hide from him right you remember the story God comes anyway he invades their life and that's what he does with us today and that's what he's doing with these these churches he's, he's invading their space and saying hey guys this is what I'm like therefore this is what you should be like and that's what he's going to do to us all the way through this book of Revelation but now there are a couple of other churches they're also they're very interesting so among the seven we find two that receive no rebuke from Jesus you kind of remember the outline of how he'd go he'd say I know this about you and you've done this good or you've done well at this but I have this against you right yes except for Smyrna and Philadelphia they get no rebuke there's no but at all and if you remember they were the two poorest smallest most insignificant churches of the seven isn't that interesting isn't that interesting God has a completely different view of them Smyrna if you remember was very poor they were always financially struggling they never made the budget they never had enough money to to do the things they wanted to do and yet God Jesus Christ says to them I know your poverty but you're rich so evidently he was looking at something other than how much money they had in the bank when he said they were rich and Jesus says in in uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 8 to the church of Philadelphia he says and if I get in the right chapter I'll get it to the church of Philadelphia he Philadelphia he says this I know your works behold I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut I know that you have but little power little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied me wow they have no power they have no influence in the community nobody if, if you drove into town in Philadelphia nobody says hey you gotta go to this church over here because they're rocking out and they're doing this and they're doing that they don't have anything and yet to them God has no rebuke it seems to me and we touched on this as we went through there that Jesus judges things by a different standard than we do it seems to me that when scripture tells us he looks at the inside not the outside that's really what happens isn't it amazing the scripture is actually right yeah a different standard when he looks at these churches he doesn't 
judged by size, by influence, by uh, amount of, of funds that they have. He judges by their heart attitude towards him and towards his word. That's the standard. Now, in saying that, I am not saying, therefore, a small struggling church is better than a big non-struggling church. Not at all. It's, this is in no way uh, an excuse for us to become self-satisfied because then we fall into the same trap that some of the, the bigger successful churches here in our book fell into, don't we? So we still want to grow. We still want to do all the things God has told us to do. But the thing we need to know is God loves a small struggling church as much as he does a large successful church if the heart attitudes are the same. Because that's what he looks for. So if he judges by a different standard than we do, what is that standard? We need to know, don't we? Well, um, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, and uh, Mike did a good job of sharing that with us, he says this, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, that's a familiar verse of Scripture. We Christians go around quoting that all the time. But you know what we do? Sometimes, inadvertently, subconsciously, we do a little bit of mental gymnastics when we read that verse. Now, where it says... God is love, we flip it around and think, well, love is God. Therefore, I need to look at what we think love is, and then that's what God is like. But that's backwards, isn't it? No, we need to look at what God is like, and that will show us what love is like. We need to, get, need to have that straight in our minds. And that's his standard. God measures his church by its love for him, for each other and for others. That's how he measures his church. Whether you're a church of five people or a church of 5,000 people, that's his standard. Your focus, your heart attitude should always be on God first, our brothers and sisters second, and then our broader community third. But what do we do? We focus on me first, then God, then others, or whatever our, our priorities are. We need to train ourselves to focus on God first. That was the problem in Ephesus, wasn't it? You remember Ephesus, very successful church. Wonderful. Ephesus was a place to be at that point in history. Wonderful city. Uh, everybody's making money. Everybody's doing well. It's just, a, you know, all kinds of things to see and do. And uh, the church is very successful, very wealthy. They're busy. They're doing stuff. And, and the angel recognizes all that and he says, but you've lost your first love. Remember? So all that stuff is for naught if we do it without love. And, and we talked about what love it was they lost, and uh, I, I hope you uh, determined along with me that he was talking about love for God and for others. Because if you love one, you automatically do the other. You can't love one and not do the other. Okay? So that's what he's interested in. Jesus himself set the standard. Uh, in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, does he say, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. By this all men will know you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. Now, I, I probably should have read it because I memorized it in a different version than is up there, but close enough. All men will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. So how do non-Christians judge if we're Christians or not? If we have love one for another. God's people will be lovers of his word as well. Okay, now this is important too. We must be lovers of his word as well. We will love his word so much that we will want to understand it. We will want to look at it. We will want to know what makes it tick. Uh, think about it. 
When you love something or someone, you spend time with them, don't you? And you want to know what makes them tick, and you want to touch them, and you want to hug them, and you want to do all that stuff with them. Our approach to God's Word should be the same. In fact, in, uh, in 1 John, John says uh, that what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched, what we have handled, this we proclaim to you. And if you read that in the Greek, the word that he is actually using there is, uh, uh, it, it's the word we use for fondle. And when you fondle something, what do you do with it? You touch it all over, you caress it, you try to, you know, get close to it. Well, that's the approach we should use to God's Word. Yeah. Really get intimate with it and know it because in His Word, He reveals Himself to us. And if He's the object of our love, we're going to want to know about Him and want to know what makes Him tick. There must be, you see, a balance. Because here's another problem with the human condition. Uh, we tend to be over here or over here. You ever notice that about human beings? It's often the way it is, isn't it? But in John chapter 4, you remember the story of the woman at the well? Jesus is having a discourse with her. And they get, they get around to talking about worship. And he says to her that God is seeking those who worship him how? In spirit and in truth. And I think it's... it's uh, Pretty accurate to say spirit can be love, truth can be his word. So we need to be emotionally worshiping him, but at the same time we need to be intellectually worshiping him. See, we need to be doing both. Otherwise we become unbalanced. And we saw that in some of, his, some of the seven churches, didn't we? Some of them were so loving they had no standards. Anything goes, we love you anyway, it's okay. They were a little imbalanced over here, weren't they? And then we saw some that they had their doctrine all right, they had all their ducks in a row, they were way over here, but they didn't love anybody. They lost their love. So they're out of balance. We need to be here, where we're loving Him in spirit and in truth. Love alone will run amok. Okay? It will just run amok. If all we do is love, we're going to be doing things and accepting things and that we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't be accepting. We won't hold ourselves to any kind of a standard. And that's not what God wants. Now on the other side of that is, if all we do is study, if all we do is go learn Greek and go learn Hebrew and so, so we can conjugate our verbs and things and get all that stuff right and don't love, that's no better. You just run amok over here and sit over there. Now, your personality will dictate where you go. See, some people are just naturally loving, caring, emotional driven individuals. And that's good. Some people are just logical, scientific thinkers. And that's good. The trick is to know which one you are so you can make sure you work on staying balanced. Because the thinkers will want, tend to become unbalanced over here. They'll know the Greek and all that stuff, but they're so busy studying it, they won't get out and deal with anybody. And if you're a lover, you over here, but you're just all emotional and oh, it's so wonderful or oh, it's so terrible or whatever it is. So we want to identify who we are so we can make sure we're in the middle. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See? So if we're a knowledge person, we have to make sure we have a good portion of love or we're going to become prideful, arrogant, whatever. And I, I'm not in any way putting down study and education. I think it's great. We should all be involved in it. But we also need to throw a big dose of love in there. And you lovers, same way. You need to throw some study in there too and make sure that you're, you're running on God's word and not on your emotions. 
So on one hand we can become cold and dead, on the other hand we can just become frivolous and not much use in that way either. So what's the solution? The solution is this. We cultivate love. In Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25. And God tells us there, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we're going to cultivate love. And I want to share with you a little quote here from one of my favorite contemporary theologians, Alexander Strzok. This little book he wrote is called Love or Die. And he's actually dealing with Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 in this book. But here's what he says. It's a, it's a little lengthy. It's a paragraph, but I think you guys can deal, deal with it okay. He says, Love is vital to the spiritual health of the individual believer and to the local church. So cultivating love within the church body is a subject dear to my heart. I grieve over churches that have lost touch with the New Testament spirit and practice of love. I mourn for churches that are arrogant because of their sound doctrine but are soundly asleep in regard to their love. I also mourn for churches that are proud of their love but are doctrinally asleep. It is disillusioning to see churches that because of distorted views of love refuse to discipline unrepentant sending men or Members, It is distressing to see self-satisfied Christians who refuse to grow in their love. So in other words, we need both. As we cultivate one, we should automatically be cultivating the other. Jesus said to us in Mark and in Matthew, he said, we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. Now that was in response to a question that was posed to him, what is the greatest commandment? And he laid it out. He says, there it is. That's the greatest commandment. But you know what? You can't do that in isolation. There are Hebrews passage, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You can't learn to love others unless you are engaged with others. That's why God gave us this portion of Scripture. For Christians, the local community is the church. I've noticed, though, that some people, when they read this passage, it says, consider how to stir one another up. Doesn't it say that? It does. And they stop there. And they go out and they love stirring the pot. You know? Yeah, I'm going to call up Joe today and tell him how everything that was wrong with the music. And, uh, well, did you see that coat the pastor was wearing? That's no good. You know, you know and on and on. They just stir. But what does it say? If you read, you read on, to stir one another up to love and good deeds. You see? That's what we're supposed to be stirring each other up to. And we can't do that unless we're in a community, a community of believers, of saints, called the church. Not neglecting the meeting of ourselves together. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever heard that somebody say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, and I just go up on the mountainside and sit under a tree and worship God because his, I can see all his creation and it's so beautiful. You've all heard people say that. And you can worship God that way, but you can't grow in community. You can't love others by sitting under a tree drinking in God's beautiful creation. You, you, you cannot work the rough edges off of yourself sitting under that tree. You need to be bumping up against other folks with rough edges. And that will take being together. Interesting to me that when God wrote a book specifically about the revelation of himself to us, now he revealed, revealed himself to John. John's the instrument doing the writing, but he didn't say this is the revelation of John or to John. Now, some Bibles even caption it that way, the revelation of John. But it's not. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ to 
whom? Not an individual. First, first thing he did was reveal himself to seven churches. Isn't that interesting? It says something to me about how important the church is to God. He wants the church to know who he is. The corporate church. Us together living the Christian life. Can't do it in isolation. So are we saying love is all we need? No, of course not. We need love and we need knowledge of God. You know, this one, this love is all we need thing can get, get to sidetrack too. I, I, I knew a couple of guys one time and uh, one of them, a very successful uh, evangelist guy, and uh, their, their verse that they clung on to is uh, Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians rather, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And uh, I want to get it right, so let me, let me read it for you. And when I came to you, brothers, this is Paul talking, I did not come proclaiming to know you, the testimony of God, with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, these two guys would hang their hat on that second verse and say, See, all Paul wanted to do was to tell them that he knew Jesus Christ and that was it. Well, that's kind of what Paul says there, isn't it? But then what did Paul do? He went on to write the rest of the book, didn't he? And then he wrote another letter to them. And then he wrote all the other letters uh, that have his signature. And he expounded all the great doctrines of the faith, didn't he? So did he just go to a church and say, I'm here, I know Jesus Christ, and you ought to know him too. We're done. No. He said, I know Jesus Christ, you ought to know him too, and here's why. And here's what he's like. And here's how you ought to live because of that. So don't get trapped in that thing. Well, all I have to do is know Jesus. Well, that's the starting point. That's, that, that's not the end. That's the beginning. Well, what is Christ-like love then? If that's what we're going to do. So we're convinced now we have to love. We've got to do it. Okay? Whether you like it or not. You've got to love. It's kind of like my mother used to tell me. I never could figure out the logic in this thing when I was a little kid. And you, you maybe you were invited to a birthday party or something and she didn't really want to go. And she said, you're going to go and you're going to have a good time whether you like it or not. And I always thought, well, that's kind of strange. How are you going to have a good time if you don't like it? But she was bigger than me, so I went. Christ-like love. John chapter 15, verses 9 through 10. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So, if you love me, you're going to abide in my love. Now, that abide uh, is, is uh, some, some verses say, or translations say remain, but what that word really meant... It means to camp out, to do something. It means to tabernacle, to dwell there, to live there. So if you really love Jesus Christ, you're going to live in him. You're going to want to do the things he asks you to do. Your, in other words, your actions are going to demonstrate that you love God not just your words. Notice how Jesus ties abiding in his love with keeping his commandments. In John 14, 15, great little verse, you should memorize that if you haven't already. Simple, it's little, short. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. See? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, sometimes we convolute things like that, concepts like that, we, and we come out with, well, we have to do these things to be his people. No. It's if you are my people, you will do these things. And notice he doesn't say, if you love me, you will keep some of my commandments or part of my commandments. He says, you will keep my commandments. So what's he talking about there? 
He's talking about you'll love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and others as yourself. Can't do that in isolation. Okay. Well, one might ask, isn't this a circular argument? You know, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And where are we going with all that? Well, come back for a moment with me. Clear back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And if you, you remember the scenario, Jesus has gone out into the wilderness and Satan has come to tempt him. And, and Satan says to him, you know, he's hungry. He's been out there for days and days and days. And Satan says, hey, just come over to my side here a little bit. And, or, or he says to him, he says, just say to these stones, turn into bread and you can have something to eat. And Jesus' response is this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what Jesus is doing there, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And the context in Deuteronomy is, God is saying, I'm going to provide all this stuff for you, but you have to get it through me. You see? And so, yes, he provides the love, but we have to provide the actions. Okay? Not only does he do things... God, but he does them for our good, doesn't he? And the same with Paul. I'll refer you back there to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Not only did he do some things, but he did them to the best of his ability, didn't he? So 1 Corinthians 10.31 comes into play. Whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And that's something God's been working with me on the last few months. And I've been talking to the, the elders about it, you know. We sometimes don't think what we're doing is important. We sometimes don't think we need to put our all into it. We'll just kind of show up if we feel like it. Or we'll, you know, if it, real easy for me. I mean, I, I could say you know what, I'm going to play golf every day this week and I'll just dredge a sermon up off the internet. Who's going to know? God will know, you see. So I better not do that. And by the way, I don't. But you see, he wants us to put our all into it. When you love something with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you don't do it half-heartedly. The two are, are antithetical to one another. Love is like faith in this context. You remember in James chapter 2, verse 17, faith without works is dead. And your faith without works is a fallacy. It's false. If you don't have works, it's evidence that you don't have faith. Love in our context is that way. If you don't have some actions to go with it, you don't have the love. It's that simple. So what have we learned from all this? And you may think, be thinking, well, gee, you kind of wandered far afield from the seven churches and you didn't tell me what the number of the beast is. You didn't tell me anything. I told you the most important thing this morning. If you don't have love, you don't have, it won't help you to know the number of the beast. It won't help you to know the day Jesus is coming back. Because if you don't have love, you're lost. And if you say you have love and you don't have some actions to go with it, you don't have the love. And there's no more pitiful person than the person that is self-deceived, self-deluded. So what have we learned about the seven churches? Well, for one thing, the, the letters to the seven churches are timeless. They were for then, they are for now, and they are for forevermore until Christ returns and sets up his kingdom here on earth. The second thing is we must learn to evaluate a church using God's standard, which is often quite different than our own. Love and faithfulness to his word is his standard. Third, I think, love requires action, but not just any action. If you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And fourth, whatever we do, do it as unto the Lord. 
You know, there, there are times when we're just short. We're, we're late. We're, we're busy. We're, uh, just because of the circumstances in the world we live in. That's okay. God understands that. But when we're short and busy and all that just because we didn't care enough to try, I think he understands that too. And that's a little scary. It's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, God will step in and he'll help you when you're in trouble through no fault of your own. But if you uh, are there simply because you're too lazy to do something about it, he'll probably let you just deal with the circumstances. Or the so, do me a, a, a favor this year and just think about everything you do and, and don't worry about Pastor Darrell and what he thinks and what he sees, but hold up everything you do and remember God sees that. And, and just try to do it with that attitude that you're doing this for the glory of God. Whatever it is. It just might make a huge difference in how, how you worship, how you enjoy the things God has given you. Because, you know, sometimes we, we forget, too, that the things He's given us, He's given us to enjoy. So enjoy them with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You know, I, 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 you read in the Song of Solomon and that, and it talks a lot about enjoying things. So we could do that. And I think we will enjoy our lives a lot more when we have our priorities right and we know that God is smiling at us. And you know, what that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're going to do everything right. It doesn't mean that you're going to be successful at everything. If you put all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in it, God's good with it. Whether it works out in your eyes or not. And that's kind of hard for us to get, keep straight sometimes, but God's good with it. So if my car breaks down, and I do the best I can to try to fix it, which I always do, but I never succeed. I'm just not mechanical. I can't fix anything. God's good with that because I did the best I could do. So it's not the success that God's concerned about. It's the doing. It's the process. So whatever you do, whether you ever eat, whether you drink, do it all to the glory of God. Father, thank you for showing us how, what love is and how to love one another. And the Lord, you know more than anybody how often I need to be reminded because it's just not my nature. I'm one of those thinker guys. And, I need you to keep correcting me all the time. And I appreciate the fact that you do. And so, Lord, help us as a congregation to recognize that all the little mundane things that we do that we think you don't take any notice of, you're watching them. You know the hairs on our head. You know when a sparrow falls from a tree. And you know when we do the best we can do for you. And we know that makes you happy. And so, oh God... Help us to be those kinds of Christians. Helpful, eager, enthusiastic. The results can take care of themselves. We just want to make sure that in the process, we are doing it unto you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.